Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Mike Connaughton, and this is Niebuhr. You know, much of the legend and the history of the Old West surrounds horses. Tough stock like this guy were used to pull Conestoga wagons and sleighs and plows and stagecoaches. Even earlier, Native Americans and mountain men used horses for their livelihood. Some fast and furious, others steady and sturdy, but always there to serve man in one form or another. Tonight, we're gonna look at the horse in a new light, as a healer. It's an idea that capitalizes on the long-standing bond between man and horse, bringing out the best in both. His name is Butterball, we call him B-Ball for short, thanks for a shorter name tag. Dan Wolf is the chief wrangler of Twin Peaks Guest Ranch near Sam. I'm just kind of limited on beginner horses. That wasn't any problem. I got riders out on the trail. If you have any problems, get off your horse and I'll be alone. Okay, great. Great. That's nice to know. But these folks aren't saddling up for your traditional trail ride. Instead, the ranch is hosting the Rich Rogers Memorial Ride-a-thon, a special fundraising event that has lured horse lovers from all over. Thanks, I'm going to need it. Since early morning, trucks and trailers have been crossing the Salmon River to begin the slow climb up through the Rim Rock to this spectacular location. Over 100 riders are participating, some on their own horses and others riding the mounts donated by the ranch. The idea is that riders solicit pledges and then choose one of the marked trails, ranging from a slow, easy loop to a 19-mile excursion among the peaks. Uh, yeah, I'm having a pretty good time. I'm just about ready to get off, though. I wanted to do the 19-mile, and the guy said, no, you need to do seven, because you're not experienced enough, and the horses aren't experienced enough, and now I thank God I did not do the 19. <laughs> I want to do a two and a half and get off. Despite a threat of rain, the mood is light. The sense of community strong as friends and families gather for a day dedicated to horses and healing. Ow, 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 ow. Kyle wanted to pick some flowers for mom. The money raised goes to support the Whitewater Therapeutic Riding Association, an organization that provides a variety of therapies by teaming horses with people. It's an integration of folks with disabilities and non-disabilities. And it can be anything from a mental disability, a physical disability, a speech, hearing. Yeah. By working with an animal, they, they get a self-gratification and respond. When the horse responds, well, people respond. The premise is based on the saying that the outside of a horse is good for the inside of a man. And this is proven true for Beth Smith. A devastating car accident three years ago put Beth in a wheelchair, robbing her of most of her motor skills. So last summer, when therapist Gail McCampbell suggested horseback riding, Beth's mom reacted with skepticism. I thought, no way. Uh, though she was raised on a ranch, she was never interested in horses. And um, Beth could just barely sit independently in a chair. And I, I didn't think that there would be any way in the world. Credit Beth's perseverance and grit. When she began the horse therapy, Beth could only stay on an animal with another rider mounted behind her, holding her up. Now, this determined young woman can ride unassisted for over 30 minutes. She rides for pleasure, but I'm a therapist, and I know that the, I can use the horse as a therapy tool. I take the movement, the natural movement of the horse at a walk, imparts that same movement to Beth's hips and allows her to work on her balance. It um, relaxes her muscle tone, helps improve her posture. It has done, you know, it has done, physically has helped Beth, it has helped her just emotionally and to know that she can do those things and that her healing is progressing. The healing window for a brain stem injury like Beth's is five to 10 years. Someday this 21 year old college student hopes to walk again, 
But for now, her moments of independence come on the back of Charlie. I'm looking forward to the day that I can saddle up and just ride along beside her. We're not there yet. We're, you know, we're still walking her, but I'm looking forward to that day. Horse therapy is not a new concept. It began in Europe and has become popular on the East Coast. Chapters have appeared in some larger population centers of the West, but this one in Salmon is one of only two centers in Idaho, certified by the North American Riding for the Handicapped Association. In the beginning, it was primarily for people with uh, developmental disabilities, primarily adults, and now um, people with brain injury, people with autism, people with learning disabilities. I think you found Developmental your therapist think Joy Scott was one of the founders of the Idaho program. Do you remember the knot? After going through the formal steps of training, incorporating and recruiting a volunteer board of directors, she approached Gail McCampbell to be their therapist. Good, okay. I had been told it worked, and it only took me, you know, one season to see that it could really make some remarkable changes for people with mental and physical disabilities, and that it would be fun while we were doing it. Gary Power has been around stock animals all of his life. Even before he joined the board of directors, Gary was well aware of the strong bonds forged between horse and man. Animals work well with, with all people. I think they've proven that older folks, if, if they can have a pet, uh, they have more fulfillment in their life. Uh, with a lot of the folks around the Salmon Valley, they've been around horses all their life. Uh, we work with the elderly that are in the, the care center and bring them out once a week so that they can uh, some of them actually ride, some of them just want to pet the horse, some of them just want to work with pack and uh, polish saddles or work with bridles. It's fantastic. It gives them something to look forward to. So today we're going to demonstrate um, some kind of elementary aspects of vaulting because we're a new club. The vaulting club is made up of preteen and teenage boys and girls who are benefiting from the Whitewater Therapeutic Riding Association. It's a sort of gymnastics on horseback, designed to build an individual's balance and strength. In the process, it fosters a sense of trust and promotes interpersonal relationships. Real good, girls. And sometimes it's easier to learn to communicate with a horse and to practice learning um, relational uh, relationship skills with a horse, and then you can apply them uh, to getting along with other people. It's a little less risky, I think, when you're dealing with a horse. But I do feel that this method, and I've looked at a lot of them and tried a lot of them, is the best for the horse, for the horse's sake, and for the human's sake. As far as Kurt Pate's concerned, it's all about communication and trust. He's what some folks would call a horse whisperer. I'll ask to lead with my right hand, and I'll drive with my left. If it doesn't work, I'll just... Kurt was an advisor to Robert Redford in the movie produced from the best-selling novel, The Horse Whisperer. Here, as part of the program, he's demonstrating his training techniques, teaching an unbroken horse to accept halter, saddle, and rider in under three hours. I wouldn't want to have her tied up and try to do this. That would cause quite a problem with the horse. Kurt works the horse slowly and steadily until the saddle is in place. All right. Hopefully we can keep her, get her still here. Pull my saddle there, come under her belly. And then finally, and with a great deal of reassurance, he gently swings his leg over and sits astride. It's the final triumph in a day of achievements. The time has come to celebrate. We need beans. Beans up. The day is capped with a classic Western barbecue, a scene that could easily have been part of the Robert Redford movie. There's some deep roots here, a belief in community spirit that many in America are struggling to recapture. And that's, I guess, you know, people say, oh, it's so great that you do this. And it, it, um, it's almost insulting to hear that because you get so much back from it that it's almost like they do so much for you. And um, to put people and animals together and you're doing something in a lot of jobs, you can't make anybody happy. In this job, uh, pretty much everybody likes what you do, so it's really a rewarding job. You make a difference for people, and that's neat. Up next, wildlife in the city. Okay. 
The recovery of the peregrine falcon is a remarkable story. It was listed as an endangered species in 1972. And now it appears that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service may remove it from that list sometime in 1999. Scientists are aware of over a thousand pairs nesting nationally. 16 of those are right here in Idaho. They often nest on an isolated cliff, but it seems as though one pair prefers a perch with a penthouse view. The name means wanderer, and they just, uh, they just uh, follow the sun and the wind and go wherever uh, they, you know, the compass points them. This year, the compass pointed them to the top of the Key Bank building in downtown Boise. A wild male and a female that had been raised and released by the Peregrine Fund wandered to this nest box and decided it was a great place to raise a family. They actually showed up here in March, uh, laid eggs probably in early April, and uh, these young are about 30 days old now. Um, really? we, have three, we have three young. Of course, the fascinating thing about falcons, they go from zero to flying in 45 days. So. This is the first time falcons have nested in the city center of Boise. In 1988 and 89, captive chicks were brought in, raised and released on a downtown rooftop. But none of those returned to nest. Now, 10 years later, the empty box has become a home. This is the day we, we get to put some jewelry on the, on the kids. Um, each band has an individual uh, number that will identify it for the rest of its life. And the, the, we use this information for tracking the distribution and the movements of these birds. There's one right here. Not a happy, not a happy kid. As wildlife biologist Bruce Hawk grabs one of the three chicks, the adult female bursts from the nest box, screaming her rage. The commotion is unbelievable. She turns and dives again, relentless, as she tries to protect her young. Okay. She's defending just like any predator that gets fooling with her kid. She's going to try to get close enough to, to scare us away and force us to leave. It's a precarious job handling wild birds on a narrow ledge 13 stories high. But as Bruce points out, normally biologists are repelling into nests to do this. Here, at least, you can take the elevator. This one's a girl. You can tell by the, the, the tarsus are real thick. The females and birds of prey are larger than the males, and uh, this one's got a real much heavier foot than the male we just banded. Boise's not the only city that has attracted peregrine falcons. Drawing the birds to urban centers was actually part of the recovery strategy for the species. Well, it really came as a result of observations from the 1930s and 1940s when they found that falcons were coming in from the wild areas and nesting in the eastern cities. And they uh, invaded Montreal and Philadelphia and Baltimore and, and, uh, and simply moved into the city situation and initially tried to nest on buildings unsuccessfully because there, no, there was no rock ledges. People added nesting sites to the buildings, and soon the urban peregrines were taking care of the city's pigeon problem. Years later, when the peregrines became extinct, they went back to the city areas, not so much because they were the optimum place to have falcons living, but it was one of the few places where there weren't any predators. Peregrine chicks hatched in captivity were released in the cities where they had a better chance of making it. Their cliff sites in the wild had been taken over by a traditional enemy, great horned owls. Today, nesting peregrines are a common sight in cities like Minneapolis, Minnesota. And at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, falcons have been raising young for the past seven years. Staff members and patients in the hospital get an opportunity to watch the birds in action on closed circuit televisions. In Seattle, peregrines have been nesting on skyscrapers since 1994, and anyone online can watch their progress. A live camera at the nest site is hooked up to send images directly to a web page on the internet. We can either put it right in that corner or we can put it over here and run it back to the louvers. Boise's peregrines will also have the opportunity yeah. to be television stars. A camera set up on the ledge sends images down to the lobby of the Key Bank building. In no time, the birds have built an audience. Laura Lida checks on the birds every morning as she comes to work. I think it's great. I've enjoyed it, so I hope they continue to make their home here. A week after banding the offspring, it became evident that the adult male had met with some sort of misfortune and disappeared. 
So the decision is made to supplement the food brought by the mother each day with some commercially raised quail. Well, the adult female just arrived. She sees one of the food items that was put up on the ledge, and now the young, having seen her, come over to get the food that she brought them. But of course, we just happened to provide here a few minutes ago. And uh, so mom gets to take credit for that meal, which is a good deal. And of course, the three young instantly mob her, and one of them grabs the food and uh, has decided that it's gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna have that food for its breakfast. The chicks thrive and eventually attempt to fly. But the windows and wires of a city can be a dangerous place for an inexperienced bird. One of the young females doesn't survive. But the other two offspring are soon seen about the city. Strong, graceful, and wild. I think peregrines are really special because they represent wildness in its purest form. Uh, it, it is a, a unique opportunity for people to be able to drive into a downtown area of a city and see an endangered species, literally drive up Falcon Nest, where they can park at the steps of a state capitol and look into uh, the future for wildlife conservation, which, which uh, peregrine falcons have been probably the most uh, highly rated and most successful wildlife reintroduction program anywhere in the world. In essence, we're training a trainer more so than the dogs, and the dogs just are, sometimes are here for, for the ride, you know, and just have a good time, so. Here we go. You know, one of the biggest rewards of bird hunting is watching a good dog at work. They all start out as puppies, you know, plenty of enthusiasm, but not a lot of finesse. The key is training for the refinement without squelching their eagerness for the game. It's Thursday night, and the trucks start pulling in. For the past 15 years, the German short-haired Pointer Club of Idaho has been meeting every week from the onset of daylight savings time in the spring until bird season opens each fall. Most of the dogs are young puppies, anxious like children before a birthday party. And the owners, well, they may be a bit more restrained. But with bird season just around the corner, they're getting the fever too. Vic! You'll be on tap. That's Norm Anderson. He kind of keeps things organized. He also can't hide an intense pride in his latest pup, an eager German short hair named Gus. Everything will be fun for him. That's the idea behind training young dogs. Make it fun. But Mike Akamura has another premise. Again, about he says they're feet, really training the owners. We tried to train not the dogs here, but to train the trainers. Because dogs by themselves, they have a, an inherent ability to point. Otherwise, we wouldn't be calling them pointers. But we, not all of us, do have the necessary either knowledge or patience to become a reasonable trainer. So, in essence, we're training the trainer more so than the dogs. And the dogs just are sometimes are here for a, for the ride you know and I just have a good time so the idea is to get the puppies out of the backyard and into the she field around real birds mike places live pigeons in these remote control traps and then hides them in the brush they're strategically placed in response to each dog's individual ability it's important that the dog's got enough style to let you know when she's got the bird absolutely right from past experience Mike knows that this dog will yeah, usually again, point properly. So tonight, Victor Rudder and his English setter Bell are going to work on holding the point. She's got it, right there. Don't, let, don't give her a chance to move up. Keep it tight and walk right up to her. Oh, what a nice tail. Here goes the first bird. This is where puppy eagerness overshadows adult refinement. A finished dog it, should stay staunch until its master releases it with a touch or a command. Heel. Heel. It's called Heel. steady to wing and shot. She's 10 months old. She's learning. This is about her fourth time out, so it's all new to her. So She's doing real good for a pup for 10 months old. Next up is Joe Carter, his point German point short hair guy. Guy's a little older almost exactly a year so he has his rookie hunting season already behind Turn him. Here and pose. although the puppy still comes out in the wiggle of the tail he does hold fairly well when the birds released and shot oh, boy. 
they tend, tend to wag their tail, and Mike was just telling me how to fix that. I mean, that's something we'll do in the training. Right now, he's, he's been in the yard a lot and not out here in uh, an unknown situation. It's been a little more predictable. And so he's not as focused. He, he thinks, okay, I wait here, and I'm going to get some birds. We need to maintain that, um, that, that anxiety that the dog doesn't know exactly when the bird's going to go. Cruz is a five-and-a-half-month-old German shorthair. I mean, keep it short, keep it short. Owner Blake Tompkins is working on his uh, dog's intensity, on trying to keep Cruz focused. He sees a bird go, and he's a bird dog. <laughs> he wants to go chase, and that's expected of him. The dogs may need to work on intensity, but the owners don't. Okay, Neither the threat of thunderstorms or the impending darkness deters them. For the birds beckon, and the fall season is just around the corner. Just to keep in the spirit of bird season, on tonight's creature feature, we'll profile the sharp-tailed grouse, one of Idaho's upland game birds. The sharp-tailed grouse is probably best known for its unusual mating ritual. Each spring, during the breeding season, the males scramble frantically to and fro across a dancing area called a lap. The birds rapidly stomp their feet, turning in circles with their sharp tails on display. This mating dance determines which of the males will win the privilege of breeding with a female and earn the right to pass on their genetic code to the next generation. <laughs> 